This is Stacey McKibben with the Master Communicator Podcast, where CEOs, senior leaders, and C-suite executives share their advice. It's six questions in nine minutes because the best leaders know how to share their ideas concisely and quickly. Let's jump right in. Question number one, in a few sentences, please tell us who you are and what you do. So my name is Dave Parker. I'm a five-time founder who's been uh, fortunate enough to sell three of those companies, close two of them, and then be part of about a dozen exits all total and a recent author. My goodness. So I'm guessing with that experience, you have one or two things to teach us about leadership and helping I've people through change. Definitely made my share of mistakes, which is something you learn more from than your successes, but uh, tend to be the p- things that people want to um, paper over or have revisionist history about. <laughs> well, we're going to dish about those today. So I'm looking forward to hearing your insights. So uh, that, that kind of transitions me nicely into my first question, which is what's the best thing about leading people through change from your perspective? Yeah. So today I get to work with founders and startup um, folks who have ideas about what companies they want to launch and what things they want, they want to do. So the, the change thing I always tell them is that you, you need to have strong opinions lightly held and hopefully informed by data. So I meet a lot of people who have strong opinions and they're super passionate and passion's critical, but not sufficient for what I do with founders and frankly, for what any entrepreneur does. So you need to have strong opinions. They need to be lightly held and hopefully informed by a good set of data. They can help you make good decisions as you go through the process. I love that visual that it kind of creates with that that lightly held, because you can kind of see with opinions, it's like we hold on to them with all of our might versus that visual that you give us like, okay, you can have them, but just don't grip so tightly. (laughs) Well, and especially for founders, when you're like, I'm going to launch, I'm going to leave my day job and launch this new company. And I have, maybe I have only one idea and the idea might be a bad one, which is why 70 to 90% of startups fail. And it has to do with that founders um, hold onto that one idea super firmly and, you know, won't listen. And, and every once in a while, somebody will get on the phone with me and say, hey, I, I came to seek your advice about this thing. And then they're like, yeah, yeah, I don't want that advice. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted advice that validates my idea. And I'm like, that's not why you called me. You called me to get advice, not uh, confirmation bias. Not an echo chamber. <laughs> exactly. So what piece of advice then would you give to other leaders about implementing change? Well, I think you just need to be part, recognize that change is going to be a constant. Right. Yeah. And get comfortable with that. And if you if you view this as an adventure and change is part of it, then you see it as an opportunity, not as a challenge. Where I think founders who and, and, and leaders who don't embrace that mindset are due to get really, you know, down into a rabbit trail or a corner because they just don't see it as an opportunity. And and yet from a customer perspective, it's usually coming from a customer's perspective of what the customer wants, um, not what you want. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the Henry Ford quote is, if I asked my customers what they want, they would have said a faster horse. I always remind people that that was pre-internet <laughs> when all, all the cars were black, right? And you nobody had any choices. So in uh, my grandfather owned a first Ford garage in 1911 in southwestern Washington. I don't think that existed in a pre-internet world. I'm just saying there's kind of different than today. Yeah, just thinking, and well, and it's funny, Steve Jobs kind of had the same ideas, right? When he talked about the iPod, he talked about, he built it for himself and his friends who wanted to listen to great music wherever they went. Again, if he had gone out to the marketplace, he said they would have never identified that. They would have gotten a, a cooler Walkman or, yep. you know, another boom box. <laughs> yep, for sure. So I've been hearing from other leaders during this pandemic and, you know, during this time period that keeping teams engaged remotely has been a challenge, that they just haven't had the benefit of the walk by leadership, the catching people at the water cooler, that sort of thing. I'm curious, in your experience, have, have you experienced some of that? And if so, what, what kind of tips were you sharing with folks and helping them to overcome some of those challenges? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things that's going to be forever changed as we come out of this is that our networks aren't the same as they used to be. So n- networks used to be geographically constrained or even constrained within the water cooler. Yeah. And I think that as we come out of this, that the networks are no longer constrained the same way. The networks are going to be organized by values and by relationships, but not by geography. So the sooner that I think leaders kind of embrace that and recognize that that's going to be part of the outcome of this, I think the sooner that they'll be able to see their organizations grow and change. It's also surfaced a lot of weaknesses when there's intrinsic weaknesses within leadership of, hey, I can do a management by walking around. I can't, <laughs> right? And you know what? When it comes back, it's not going to be the same. We're going to be in virtual. We're going to be in- Hybrid. You know, uh, it, totally. And it, it, But 
for people again who are highly opinionated but don't want to change it's going to represent a tremendous challenge for the organizations that embrace it and go like this is part of where we're going to be in the future and it's going to be forever change i think the the employee definitely benefits and i think the organizations will benefit for the organizations that are flexible enough to figure out how to embrace it yeah i love that i mean it always kind of makes me think about that accidental leadership versus you know creating intention with your leadership approach and style and i feel like in one you were able to get lazy in your leadership versus now it requires a bit more you know again intention and preparedness <laughs> for sure i mean even as simple something as simple as time blocking your calendar and recognizing there's things you need to do and even if it feels tasky you're still you still have things you have to go do so for example for me writing a book during the pandemic i had to finish so the way you did that was to block out time on your calendar and do the best you can in the time blocks you have allowed. That may be personal reviews, that may be deadlines, but if you if you don't manage your calendar, it will manage you. Yeah. If you won't, who will? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So what daily practice do you recommend to leaders? What's a non-negotiable for you? So I think you know time blocking for me is definitely part of it. And I, I take my most productive time and make sure that I manage that into uh, what works for me from a serious standpoint, and I don't change from that uh, unless there's really, really good compelling reason to do so. Uh, with the lack of travel, I've been doing uh, seminars for the Middle East where I'd normally travel somewhere for a wonderlust perspective and go do a seminar. Um, I'm now doing them overnight for Cairo and Bahrain. But uh, instead of traveling 16 hours, that good news is I got to sleep on my own pillow. So managing it, knowing managing your calendar is one big thing that you can be in control of. And I think for most leaders, we're defined by what we say no to, not by what we say yes to. So really looking at it and saying, can I be great at that particular topic? Can I deliver above and beyond that? Um, or should I look at doing something different? One of my favorite hacks these days is using Fiverr. I don't know if you're familiar with Fiverr, but it's F-I-V-E-R. I look at stuff at the beginning on my Mondays and I'm like, what stuff can I send to somebody for 25 or $50 to have them do? So I don't have to do it. And it's such a great use of, um, you know, for them, it's a task that they can complete. Um, for me, it's something I can take off my, my checklist of stuff I have to go do. That's not a great use of my time, right? Mm -hmm. As far as a return on investment perspective, there are things that I can outsource that are totally okay. And that those people are better at than you are anyway, in which case, no matter how much time or how little you might Hey, it costs you so much more in your time and you know totally. what you can earn in return. You get what yep. I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So what other successful business leaders like yourself should be on the show? You know, in other words, who where are you getting your influence from, Dave? Who are you paying attention to and who should we be having here for for everybody else to hear? So a so a few years ago I had um, I was challenged over a, a New Year's Eve dinner with a friend about how many books do you read a year? And I was like, I probably read 35, 40 books a year. Okay. And so, somewhere over the course of the evening, probably during the second bottle of wine, there was a discussion around like, have you ever set a goal to read books? And I'm like, no, I actually haven't. So it's, we settled on a hundred books. So, the, the, so that year we did a hundred books that year and I actually did it for three years in a row. Um, so one of the most recent ones that I would tell you, an author that I read most recently was the co-founder, um, of Square named um, Jim McKelvey. And Jim wrote a book called The Innovation Stack. So I don't know if you've seen that one yet or not, but he talks about finding mentors that aren't uh, necessarily alive. It was just really aha, interesting thing. He's like, you can find a mentor because you can find what they wrote in history and you can find a, about how they think. But I always kind of look back and I, I over mentor today because I had a lack of mentors before, right? But I thought Jim's approach to it was like, what can I learn from these things that people have written down over time? So I think that's one of those that I look at and go like, that's a super is interesting idea. Um, I think the, you know, there's a, a guy named Mark Nogger at Greater Colorado Venture Fund that is, they're reinventing venture capital for the emerging market and manufacturing in the, uh, the rural settings. So people who are doing interesting things with capital, I think is a really interesting season for that because there's lots of capital available. But the question is, how do we create jobs in places that um, doesn't have access to the same capital. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of asymmetry in access to capital in those markets um, where there's super hot markets for, for tech and venture where I look at and go like, there's a bunch of people doing really smart things there and 
there's lots of capital floating around. So I like the stuff that they're doing in those emerging markets have been super interesting. I also like some of the places that are emerging in the world. So uh, Albert Malatiz runs Flat Six Labs in, in uh, Cairo, like seeing what deals they're seeing as an accelerator program there in the, the Middle East and North Africa is super fascinating because I think this, those, those perspectives of asymmetry are particularly interesting where you apply as a leader what you know about your industry to different industries. And it really forces you to get outside of your box and look at opportunities that are different and people who are different as well. So that, that part to me is always really fun. I love that. You're totally screaming to that whole phrase of we are the combination of the five people we spend the most time with, right? And you know, one of the things I like to encourage people is those can be books, those can be authors. It doesn't have to be, you know, an actual person. And you just exemplified that perfectly. That's great. Yeah. And I think that one encouragement I give people as they look at books is I, I have kind of a 50 page rule. Right, is if you don't hook me in 50 pages, I'm gonna put it down. I'm out. Right, so I'm out. But but when you when you have a goal of 100 books a year, the answer is once you get in, I'm in and I'm gonna finish it, right? Because half halfway done books don't actually count. So that's <laughs> part of what I encourage you that, you know, there's, there's books out there that should challenge you and intellectually stimulate you and get you to think differently about uh, what you wanna do as for yourself as a leader and for your business and uh, for your community. I also like the, you know, I'm encouraged by folks who are doing things that are bringing people along with them, right? I think one of my one of the things for my career is I look back at early and I've built relationships not just with the executives that I was around, but with the people who were on those teams who are now doing really fascinating things and have exceeded like they were junior talent at the time, but now they're not, mm -hmm. right? The benefit of being around for a while. So how can you invest in people and pull people along with you? And and along that line, how do you mentor people who don't look like you? Right. So that's, you know, in venture capital and in, in my world, 3.2% of all venture capital dollars goes to white guys named Dave and less than 2.8% goes to women and less than 1% goes to Latinx and, and African-American founders. Mm -hmm. So it's not that Dave's are the bad guys. It's that we just need to be mentoring people who don't look like us to bring them along with us in the process. I love everything you're saying. I could do three more podcasts just with you alone. But unfortunately, we are to the end of our time. <laughs> but it's been such a pleasure to have you on the show, Dave. I'm curious if somebody wanted to reach out and introduce themselves, how might they go about that? Well, you can definitely find me at uh, www.dkparker.com is my blog. I have a book coming out called uh, Trajectory Startup, uh, Ideation to Product Market Fit. It ships on the 13th mm -hmm. of April. I just found it today. It was delayed, which is sad. But um, it's, it's designed for founders with an, an idea and they're thinking about leaving their day job. Mm -hmm. And so you can find me there. You can find me on LinkedIn. So it's just LinkedIn backslash n backslash Dave Parker. That's awesome. Well, my audience knows to find your contact information in the links below. So we'll be able to do that. Um, and hopefully you'll come back and join us again soon for a future Happy episode. To. Would love to have you back on the show. That's awesome. Well, thank you again so much. And this is Stacey McKibben with the Master Communicator Podcast. For more ideas and insights, please do go check us out at www.conciliateam.com. We look forward to seeing you again next time. Take care.